Okay, well, welcome to our miniature Sonic Speaker Series visit today because of all the abbre abbreviated, I should say, not miniature in any way because I don't want to minimize the the awesomeness of our, of our visitor today. Um, what I will say is that uh, I'm re really happy to welcome Jake to Sonic uh, because I tried to welcome him a few years ago and failed miserably <laughs> when he turned us down uh, to do a postdoc with us. But, uh, you know, things come back and then full circle. And so I'm thrilled to have Jake here with us. Uh, Jake is at the University of Michigan. He's been working with uh, Jason Owen Smith and others there. Um, just out of by entire coincidence, I actually saw him just a couple of weeks ago when I gave a talk there. And so I'm thrilled that he's now here with us to talk to us about social space diffusion. And before that, I should say before Michigan, uh, Jay got his PhD at, at Duke and was working primarily with Jim Moody, or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for, for having me. It really is a pleasure to be with you first. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, the talk I wanted to give today um, was, uh, yeah. okay. um, and this is on a bit of a lag, I gather. This would be on a bit of a lag, but it should have moved forward by now. Stuck? Should I switch Wi-Fi? You. There we go. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so the work I wanted to present for you today, I actually had a different project that I wanted to present for you today um, on uh, using enterprise collaboration systems to uh, try and understand how people adopt and abandon diffusion or abandon. Uh, innovations at work, or essentially how people, when people stopped and started using this, particularly as a, um, the software, it's as a function of uh, when their supervisors and peers um, stopped using it. But I was trying to switch to a new uh, approach to studying it. Um, it was going to use an instrumental variable. I thought I'd come up with a really clever instrument. And it is completely and totally uncorrelated with the thing that I wanted to use as a treatment. And I figured that out on Monday. So I thought, you know what, I better give a presentation on <laughs> <laughs> on something that actually works. <laughs> so uh, today's uh, today's talk is actually looking a little bit more. But should I should I should mention that when you you put that up about Teams at Google, etc., that you did uh, you were at Google and worked on the on the project. Yes. You want to talk a little bit about that because I keep talking about this project at Google that got this started, and then it turns out that you met Jake is actually was involved in that project. Yeah, I was um, I was not I wouldn't oversell my involvement, but yeah, I was an intern there um, and I happened to be working on that project when they were uh, getting it underway. So the um, the project was uh, trying to study teams at Google and understand um, what makes them particularly effective. Uh, and by the time I had started, they had largely figured out um, uh, their main finding, which was that uh, teams Really, psychological safety is, is what drives the effectiveness of teams at Google um, in a large part. Uh, kind of, there they found some other things, but that was kind of the main, the main effect. And they were working on developing, um, kind of, I don't know if advertising material is quite right, but they were trying to think of how to um, turn this into a training uh, for for the rest of the uh, organization. So that's kind of the interesting difference between working in academia versus working in industry. It seems to be that. Um, uh, in academia, like once you found, once you've created your finding, you kind of put it in a paper and you send out the paper and make sure everybody knows what your finding is, and then you—that's it. You're done. You win. Um, but in in industry, like you know, once you've found something, it's not really useful until somebody makes takes an action based on it. So they they were actually spending quite a bit of effort to make sure that there was a whole training program organized around and a, like a marketing program organized around the uh, around the study that they had done. Um, the part that I came in on uh, was they had always kind of had a dream of constructing some sort of dream team um, where they could like somehow find the right mixture of introverts and extroverts or some you know like some combination things um, to put on the or like some combination of personalities or educational backgrounds or something to put on a team to have it be magically just outperform any other team possible um, and. They had been looking at this in a number of different ways, um, and I looked at it in also a number of different ways. I think I, I was trying to do, I think I ran, wound up running a bunch of uh, lasso regressions trying to say like, okay, well, can we can we find any <coughs> variable at all, any any demographic, any personality variable, any variable in this data set anywhere 
that is correlated with, like any compositional data variable that's, cor that's correlated with team effectiveness. Um, and we pretty much came up blank. Um, there was just, there's just nothing. Um, and so the way that we wound up interpreting that was that conditional on being a, an employee at Google, which is a pretty high bar actually, um, pretty much anybody can work together with anybody else. Uh, and it's really about cultivating the right team dynamics, cultivating that kind of psychological safety to make the, the team actually work um, fairly effectively. So that was that was kind of interesting. It took me a while to be to kind of come around to the fact that uh, this null finding, which was at the time because I was an intern and I kind of, I wanted to get a job there, that was deeply deeply stressful. I really wanted to find <laughs> I wanted to find something like get some p value somewhere that was low enough that, <laughs> that it felt like it would actually be an effective finding. But actually, once you kind of um, once you kind of work through it, you realize, oh, like actually, this is fairly substantial. Yeah. Even my previous relationship, just like they were working previously in the past, even me there do kind of things by themselves too, just like to make it more effective. So we didn't actually, um, we didn't actually have the ability to look at that. Um, <coughs> Google is a relatively, um, or was, uh, and I guess still is a relatively young company. Um, so we kind of had people's teams as they were, um, not like their history of working on those teams. Because you know, like I think most of the people had been there for like under a year, so mm -hmm. you know they could have worked together in previous jobs, but probably not on different teams at Google. Um, yeah. So if you want. Thank to you. Yes. Yeah. No, um, yeah. So the the project I um, I have on deck for you today is looking at uncertainty in network ties, which I hope to convince you is a substantial problem, not just in um, the the motivating uh, example that I'm going to use is uh, kids in school. Um, my advisor used to describe them as little network petri dishes um, because you would have you know you've got like this self-contained group of people who all have one type of tie and you've got lots of replications of it. But I hope to convince you that this is all this is a problem in any network study um, because I know a lot of the work here uh, revolves around uh, large you know more electronic. Mm -hmm. Uh, network data collection, which I think, and I think this is also a problem for that. But uh, for this, uh, for the sake of this study, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, survey data error or errors in, in survey data collection, uh, and how we can uh, take account for that and try and incorporate some of our uh, estimates of how much error there is into uh, a diffusion study. Um, so I'm, I have this slide in here. I don't think I need to convince you that um, the spread of ideas, innovations, and information through a group of people is a foundational social process. Um, it underlies a lot of the things that we think are important about social life. Uh, so I'm largely, it, because you have you have rooms named after Everett Rogers, I'm pretty sure I don't need to, <laughs> I don't need to elaborate that. Um, but in general, in these diffusion models, kind of the idea, uh, they tend to focus very, very heavily on the presence or absence of specific ties. And so a lot of diffusion studies uh, tend to focus on this, like, well, if we start with so-and-so, um, how far will this contagion go? And how far will it go in so many steps? Uh, or in this case, like, you know, how far can A reach um, if we were to, if, that, if A gets the flu, how many people will be infected? Mm -hmm. And there's, um, this is from the Complex Contagions article, um, you know, there's, people base a lot of um, fairly substantial sets of findings on the presence or absence of a small number of ties. Um, so, you know, this was, uh, so Damon Santola, when he was doing this whole complex contagion thing, he was like, look, unless you've got a couple of extra shortcuts, um, you're basically going to see a, relative, a fairly localized contagion if it's a complex contagion. Um, and just to clarify, comp by complex contagion, you mean? It requires reinforcement. Multiple, yeah, yeah, yeah reinforcement. Uh, yeah, so more, sorry, so a simple, you know, the simple contagions are like one, if one person, uh, if you hear it from, if you hear an idea from one person, it's more likely to spread. Um, if it's a complex contagion, you need to hear it from more than one person. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So at some point, uh, the thing about those, uh, the thing about these studies, though, is that they rely on relatively, uh, relatively uncertain data. And at some point, the uh, the actual form will delete. I think so. It yeah. shouldn't be that long. Because once the slide was wait. But you are seeing the new slide, and you are not. We are not seeing it here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Edge room. Should I switch over to the Northwestern Hill? Would that help? Let's give it well. That's unusual because we normally have it go much faster. One option might be if you just give it to one of us and then we move your slide and if it when we are already on Northwestern. 
Do you have your slide? I don't know what. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, let's see. Okay. This moves a little bit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, for the time being, I might as well talk about this. So, um, when we're actually collecting data on students in school, so I, like I said, the the motivating example for this is going to be um, the spread of I, the spread of idea beliefs about smoking uh, among students in the middle and high schools. Uh, and so the actual um, and so as I was saying that you know the when we do like these kind of ab abstract diffusion studies. We think about the presence or absence of ties being particularly important, but when you actually look at how the data are collected, you start to realize that there are um, there's quite a few opportunities for error to creep in. Um, and so the first uh, uh, and easiest to kind of describe type of error uh, that can creep in is just kind of the mechanical uh, data collection error. So uh, this is what this is a photocopy of one of our actual forms that um, that people filled out. We would give students a scantron. At the back of the scantron, um, with all the attitude measures, would be this uh, page where it said, "Please list." Uh, it would be an open name generator with uh, the questions, "Please list uh, your top two best friends and top five other close friends." Uh, and students would handwrite these names. These uh, forms would get boxed up, shipped off to a graduate student at Penn State, uh, bless their hearts, and they would go through and match these students' terrible handwriting. To a roster of names in a classroom, uh, and they're pretty good at it uh, to give them some credit, but they're not perfect. Um, so this is the set of all the possible nominations. About 50% of them are there's no nomination. About 38% or so there's they found they actually did identify somebody. Another tiny fraction they found people who weren't on the roster. Like several people listed the same person who wasn't on the roster. But then for about you know 10% of the of the ties of all the possible nominations. We just couldn't find anybody. So it could be that the name was illegible. Um, for a very small fraction, uh, kids would list Superman or Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because they're, they're kids. Uh, but you know, and then like there's there's some where, you know, we we thought you know maybe there's two John Smiths or something, um, and we just couldn't we couldn't figure out who it was. Um, and so if you're trying to treat all the ties as uh, as particularly important, the fact that you're missing a whole bunch of data on these ties actually um, is a bit of an issue. Uh, and it's an issue actually that kind of, so there's the, you know, there's the higher level like, or the lower level, I guess, mechanical uh, data collection errors. Uh, but then there's kind of a broader issue of uh, fundamental uncertainty about what these ties actually mean. Um, so uh, in a study in uh, 1994, this uh, husband and wife team, Karen's and Karen's, um, actually ran the same kind of open name generator twice in three weeks uh, among 10-year-olds and among 7th graders. And they found about a 50% turnover in friends among the 10-year-olds and about a 25% turnover in friends among the 7th graders across, what, three weeks? Mm -hmm. um, this is actually a fairly unreliable, you know, we, we treat these as, as fairly important, uh, but the actual specific ties that we measure are fairly unreliable. Um, I think it's safe to say that these are relatively, uh, these are probably good indicators of rough social position in the school. Like it's not, you know, it's not uncorrelated with the people that they talk to, uh, but they are, you know, if you're trying to say that these, these specific ties are the ones that matter, uh, it may or may not actually work. Um, I actually presented this on Friday and um, to a bunch of survey researchers, uh, and then they started asking me about what if I asked better questions. Um, <laughs> so that that convinced me that presenting this to a bunch of survey researchers <laughs> was a very big mistake on my part. Um, but uh, you know, it's uh, so they asked like, what? It was a great question. They said, um, you know, what if you were to ask, um, thinking back over the past year, uh, what what would, um, you know, uh, please list the top, you know, ten people that you hung out with. Um, there would be a different there would be a different set of biases, but you know, it, that might have given you a more reliable measure. So with that as a caveat, um, I think I, I would I still would believe that there is actually a fair amount of un fundamental uncertainty about what a specific I means and what it means affectively to a person, like who people are actually listening to. Um, and yet, in spite of this uncertainty, which is actually fairly well known, um, we basically ignore it in any network study. Uh, and I I put up this list of uh, just a bunch of recent network studies um, to also and 
mainly just say that I am also guilty of this. Like, you know, it's, everyone kind of ignores this, this as a problem, like the uncertainty in network ties. We just kind of treat it like, okay, we've got this network. Cool, let's, let's do fun stuff with it. Um, and without, it, without taking into account the data uh, error. To the extent that we do take, it, uh, take the errors into account, we generally assume that they're meaningful. Um, so there's this whole cottage industry of stochastic actor-oriented models, um, sometimes called SAOMs um, or Sienna models. And uh, the idea there is that um, they're essentially modeling the change in the network ties as a function of the change in uh, people's attitudes. Uh, so they're looking kind of at the co-evolution uh, co of these. But there's really no way to account for the fact that you know maybe these ties are just changing randomly. Maybe it's just kind of churn uh, among local people, I think. Um, like I said, I've been, uh, I'm gonna be describing a specific study among adolescents in schools. Um, I think it's relatively safe to say that uh, there is also randomness in almost all of the ties that we measure, including electronic network data or um, or other types of uh, other types of ties. So I encourage you to think about this with your with respect to your own work. Certainly, I've been trying to um, with respect to other types of projects. Um, so I have a particular. Um, uh, pet solution to this. Um, so the, the idea here is we've got a, a fair amount of, hopefully I've convinced you that there's a fair amount of uncertainty in these ties and we actually should pay attention to it. Um, the pet solution that I've, I've come up with is that we should essentially uh, model, uh, run a statistical model on the network which gives us some uncertainty about the presence or absence of each tie and then uh, essentially use that, on, propagate that uncertainty into whatever we're planning on doing with the network uh, going forward. Um, this actually ties together. Um, so th there's a, there's a kind of a divide in the types of network studies. You could want, you could say that there's a set of studies that think about networks um, as kind of stable connections, and a set of studies that think of networks as random draws from some underlying uh, position uh, or some underlying social space. And so I'll cover I'll talk about that briefly, uh, and then I'll talk about the uh, specific approach that I uh, that I Put together for this. Um, I, basically, I was hoping to create a fairly general solution, but uh, the specific use case here was to use a, uh, a latent space model to model the network and to use this uh, the Friedkin style uh, weighted averaging model to model diffusion on that network and then see what happens. Uh, and then there's a whole, essentially, I wanted to look and just talk through the results as kind of um, uh, a little bit of Kind of what, what, how they, how they look if you do, if you try different modeling approaches, uh, how well we predict uh, attitudes at the next wave. So Jake, just yeah. a clarification. So your goal here is obviously to predict diffusion, but the, yeah. but you're taking noisy data and you're trying to find a way to yeah. attenuate so, that noise. Right. So I think um, I, I think that that's a good question. So the uh, uh, when I originally wrote this paper, my goal was to kind of set up an intermediate step. Uh, and say how would we um, how would we create um, first of all how would we incorporate uh, uncertainty into our diffusion model and second of all um, once we this provides an approach that could uh, allow us to estimate diffusion in cases where we can't measure the full network but we can measure something correlated with it um, and so that was my original hope was to say like here let's create this kind of uh, method to do both of those things. Uh, as a way of it trying to sell it, I said here it predicts um, attitudes at the next step. Excuse me, better than um, better than the existing net, the better than the observed network. Uh, and then reviewers pushed me on that quite a bit, and so I wound up going down that rabbit hole a fair amount. So there is a like a, there's a hefty like one of the main selling points here is that it's um, is that it does do a better job of prediction. Um, as you'll see when we get to the prediction side, I am not totally sold on that as the main reason to use it, um, which I, I admit does make this a little bit of a funny um, case. Uh, <laughs> Can you just touch your touch pad again? The last time you touched it the second time, it seemed to work. Oh, hey, yeah. Yeah, you were right. Um, good idea. Okay. Um, so I said there was, uh, so essentially you can think of this as uh, kind of bridging the divide between two types of network studies. Um, so on the one hand, um, you could think of a set of studies uh, that you might call connectionist, um, which focus on how uh, network structure or contagion processes kind of influence, like basically how things spread through a, a network. 
Uh, and the assumption here is that uh, network ties are these stable conduits for information. Um, and so these studies tend to focus on essentially if you seed with so-and-so, how far will it reach? If you remove this many people, how, how quickly will it break apart? Um, how many steps removed is A from B? Uh, to what extent does A broker between um, B and C or things like that? Um, so this is, there's like a whole, you know, you, I'm sure you recognize um, this class of studies. And that's one branch of the network literature. Um, the other branch of the network literature is, that is a great trick, thank you. Uh, the other branch of the network literature is what you might call positionist studies. Um, and so these are studies that are thinking about networks um, instead of the actual particular ties as being important for the spread of something, they think about ties as uh, indicators of some, uh, some relative social position of people um, to one another. Basically, random, uh, randomly generated from some underlying uh, social process. Uh, and so these are studies on status and hierarchy and popula like popularity, informal group membership, anything where you're trying to say, you know, what's the generating process for these ties, um, but not necessarily thinking about the ties um, as important in and of themselves. Uh, I think of those that, that class of studies as being in this branch. And so typically when, these, when people have put these, uh, when people have tried to compare these, they've kind of put them on a continuum. Um, of basically how quickly ties are changing relative to how quickly the thing is spreading over the network. Um, so on the one hand, if you have connectionists, uh, you, could ha you could label the connectionist studies as a set of uh, studies where ties are relatively stable um, and the thing that's moving over them moves relatively quickly uh, versus positionist studies where you could think of the thing moving over the network as moving relatively slowly to the ties changing. So, you know, you could think of these kind of on a selection and influence continuum. And then, of course, that leads you to this set of Sienna models, which are somewhere in the middle, uh, where people are trying to model this kind of connection or this kind of selection and influence uh, interplay. But what they don't really have a process for uh, is thinking about a case where the data that we actually measure uh, really are suit well suited by are well measured by a positionist model. Um, so in, in the case of schools, I think of network ties as essentially being a random draw from a kid's lunch table. So, you know, kids sit at a lunch table and on any given day, they're gonna draw like five friends who happen to sit with them or the five friends who happen to be there that day. Uh, but in general, those are kind of the, the actual tables themselves are relatively stable um, and they're relatively uh, stably oriented in the school kind of popularity hierarchy. So, you know, you might think of positionist models being well as describing these data well, but even, it, even in that case, we are still interested in a series of connections questions about this model. So essentially, how would you incorporate these two things um, without kind of saying, like, without overstating the or certainty about the actual observed network type? Um, and of course, and so if you were to, the way I, I was approaching this was to basically break this down and say, okay, like, well, there are a few specific problems that I think we can probably solve. Um, one, the first problem is that the networks are measured with errors. So this is the uh, bad match rate kind of problem, um, where sometimes we have, on any, or um, on any given day, uh, we might observe this tie, we might not. Um, so yeah, actually, let's, let's stick with this as the bad match rate problem. So, you know, we might have observed this tie for various reasons. We might not have observed this tie. We should be able to account for that uncertainty. The second, uh, the second part piece of this puzzle that we could, uh, we might potentially solve is that people could be influenced by people that they're not directly connected to. Uh, and so this is more, uh, this is kind of the idea that you have a, uh, essentially like if you're, if you've got, if you're drawing from your lunch table, you know, you might actually, you know, like the top five best and closest friends are not necessarily the only people that you're talking to uh, in the school, right? Um, and so potentially you might, you might expect that even if you measured the top five best and closest friends perfectly, there's some fundamental uncertainty about, you know, or there's some mismatch between that particular measure and the people who are actually influencing you. The third uh, thing that we could actually, the third uh, problem that we could actually solve is we could say that friendships actually experience routine churns. So this is like if we keep remeasuring it, you keep taking the random draws from the lunch table. Uh, so some days we observe this, some days we observe this, some days we observe that. We get different things each time. 
Uh, and so as I was saying, the, the pet solution that I kind of came to was uh, essentially smoothing the network with um, uh, with, a, with a statistical model of the network. Now, there are a number of, like I said, I was trying to uh, cr do this as a fairly general process uh, or a fairly general procedure that people could use with a wide variety of network models and a wide variety of diffusion models. Um, I learned long after I wrote this paper that statisticians refer to this as uncertainty propagation. Uh, so there was probably a whole literature that, I pro that was probably already doing this that I wasn't aware of. Nonetheless, it's published now, so we're not going to worry about that. <laughs> Uh, but the specific example that I wanted to show you um, was using a latent space model and using this weighted averaging model. And so I'll talk to you through quickly what I mean by both of those things, um, but just kind of bear in mind that you could potentially use other models um, for other purposes. So the latent space model, um, for those who aren't familiar, is actually all of these, all of the models that I, all of the network models that I was describing are essentially glorified logistic regressions. Uh, the latent, latent space model is probably the closest to a logistic regression. It essentially um, is predicting the probability of a tie between two people I and J as a function of uh, a ran like basically a random effect for I and a random effect for J. And those random effects are embedded in a low dimensional space, um, so such, such that the closer people are in that space, uh, the closer those two random effect vectors are in that space, uh, the more likely those people are to be tied. Um, visually, if you think about a, like a force-directed network layout, you know, just plot everybody in a two-dimensional space, that's going to get you very, very, very close to what the latent space model predictions are um, for those people. So that should hopefully will be relatively straightforward. Um, the weighted averaging model is also much more straightforward than it looks from this giant block of uh, text and equation. Essentially what we're doing is we're saying that people take the average, if, you know, if I measure three friends uh, averages on the survey scale from like one to five, say it's like three, two, three, um, then I would sum those all up, divide by three, and that's, you know, that's the amount of social influence. And then we uh, weight uh, their amount of social influence uh, and their amount of the extent to which they stay at one belief, or they basically, basically how much do I weight other people's opinions versus how much do I weight my own, uh, kind of average those together. and that's that's pretty much it. Jake, is there a reason why the um, on the right hand side the second term is not t minus one and it's t? Um, that... No, there is there. It should be t minus one. Okay, yeah, you're right. Okay, that's that's a typo from what I was looking at. Okay, sorry. Um, and this is this is also going to have a typo at the top. Because I also mix up with that. Oh, I think it's because before I was using t t minus one. Now you're doing t plus one. Yeah. 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 So okay. I, I switched the notation at yeah, some this point is fine. for yeah. one of those. Things. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have this uh, kind of laid out graphically. If you think of uh, if you think of this is person one, uh, this person, this person, and this person listen to person one, this person listen to person two, uh, two, and this person listen to person three. So person one isn't listening to anybody. Um, they just take the weighted average of themselves and nobody else, uh, so they stay the same. Uh, person two takes the weighted average of, them, of themselves, which is the A over A plus one, uh, and this other person, which is the one over A plus one. Uh, and basically, that's uh, that's how this weighted averaging model is going to work. Um, it's this is a so this yeah. is very similar to the the Friedkin. It is the Friedkin right. Model. It is the Friedkin yeah. model. Yeah. yeah. So this is um, this is a model that's come up. In both sociology and statistics, uh, people have developed it independently. Uh, people kind of like it because it's mainly because the math works out nicely. Um, that's mainly why I chose it is because it's a relatively simple model. But the idea here is that, like, let's show this with a simple model and then um, try it with. Uh, potentially, you could try it with something a little bit more complicated going forward. So to actually get this to work, um, I said I basically uh, tried two ways. Um, to incorporate the uh, the latent space model predictions, um, as you described, this, used to describe this as doing the simplest non-stupid thing that you could do. <laughs> so, uh, so essentially, what we did was we we tried it in one of two ways. One, you could either uh, plug in the predicted probabilities in for a tie, so that everybody is tied to everybody else with uh, a weight uh, of the predicted probability of the tie between those two people. So, if two people are very far apart, 
they're still listening to each other. It's just with a very low weight versus two people who are quite close together. Um, so this is, yeah, get the predicted probability, plug it in to the, uh, to the weight matrix that I was showing you in the previous slide, uh, and then just kind of run through the matrix multiplication, and you get that. The other way of doing this, that's, that's sort of to capture um, the uncertain, like the everybody listens to everybody else kind of uncertain, general uncertainty of the ties version. Uh, if you want to think about this in a more dynamic sense where people are listening to a set of, they are listening to a specific set of people, but that set of people is changing on a daily basis. Um, the way that I simulated that was I drew a series of uh, predicted, uh, predicted networks. Um, from those, so I got the predicted probabilities of a, of a tie between everybody, flipped a coin for those to get a, a predicted, a, like a network, a posterior predictive draw from, uh, from this model, uh, and then run the uh, diffusion process over each of those predicted networks. Um, so basically, you'd run the diffusion process for one iteration over this network, and then another, then the second iteration would be over this network, third iteration would be over that network or something like that. So far, so good? <laughs> the actual data that we tested this on um, was a data set called Prosper. Uh, these are a set of schools in rural school districts in Iowa and Pennsylvania. Um, and we have, we actually have data, this is actually a nice data set if you're looking at, if you're interested in looking at longitudinal data on uh, kids in schools, particularly with with particular interest in smoking, uh, because that's why the data were collected. Um, we they collected uh, a series of uh, they basically measured the networks among the kids uh, repeatedly over time. Oops, sorry. Sorry, I normally never keep my ringer on. I apologize. Right. Go ahead. So then you'd go. Um, so wave one was in the in the fall of the sixth grade, and then waves two, three, four, five, all the way up through eight. We're in the spring of the sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and then all the way up through twelfth grade. Um, so just to show you uh, a little bit about how the, uh, so I'll, I'll go through now, a little, like briefly, just kind of how how this model works, um, and then I'll show you some results about um, predicting future attitudes, and then we'll talk a little bit. Hopefully, we'll talk about a little bit about future directions because I think that's where this is um, this gets particularly interesting. Um, the uh, first to think about the actual model results, uh, I essentially had this, uh, basically if you plug in the two different versions of the, uh, of the weight matrix that I was talking about, here we have to uh, plug in the predictive probabilities, here we have to plug in the uh, posterior predictive distribution, that is the simulated, the series of simulated networks, and here we have the observed network. Um, so on, on time, and the colors are based on a, an attitude scale, so we're just gonna simulate what, what happens. In so before network. you go to the next slide, yeah. In the best possible world for you, C would do better than B and A. Um, both A and B would do better, or sorry. Uh, B and C, C would and be C better would than do, A. It would be better than A, yeah. Uh, that's the best possible world. Um, so the property of the Friedkin model is that it, it con everybody converges to a consensus uh, kind of in the end. Um, so, you know, if you keep re taking repeated averagings a set of uh, of a set of attitude values, a set of numbers, essentially, uh, on a scale, it'll eventually uh, kind of converge to a single point. Um, and so you see, um, after a single step, that happens relatively quickly in the uh, posterior predictive, or in the uh, include the predictive probabilities version. Uh, in the posterior predictive version, that is the simulated network, um, that happens a little bit more slowly. Um, so you can see some people ha still have uh, changed their attitudes a little bit, but not all the way down to all the way down to whatever the consensus value is. Uh, but then in the observed network, what you see is essentially people are converging to a consensus, but there are people who are isolated. Um, I think I've got this set up so that if you're in degree isolated, you won't change your attitudes. The other way around, out degree isolated? Yeah, I think it's out degree isolated. Anyway, one, ver one, uh, one set of isolates uh, aren't going to change their attitudes because they're not connected to anybody else. That would be like person one in the example that you right, gave, yes, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so someone who doesn't, uh, someone who isn't connected to anybody else isn't gonna change their attitudes under the simulation. Now, that seems like, to me that seems like an error in the simulation, right? Like that's, that's kind of an artifact of the data as opposed to an actual, 
an actual thing that we should be attempting to simulate. Um, and then if you continue doing this uh, repeatedly over a series of iterations, you see that um, uh, B and C essentially converge to the same consensus, and then in that every weakly connected component in A converges to a consensus, so you can see that there are each, um, that there are these few isolates who essentially remain unchanged uh, because they are effectively their own little weakly connected components. Uh, one of the reviewers actually suggested drawing this out as a plot like this, which I, uh, which I quite liked. Um, so this is everybody's attitudes over time. Um, you can see that in the first two probabilities, they converge to a small number of values quite quickly. Uh, and if you're flipping a coin for a different network each time, it still converges to a small set of values, but it takes a little bit longer to do it. Uh, and then if you're using the observed network, there's a few people who are isolated who just kind of get flipped. Um, we have a few other plots drawing the same thing, which probably aren't necessary to look at for the length of time. Um, this one, you know, if you were to, this is basically the distribution of attitude values um, as you keep running the simulation, um, and essentially they collapse around a set of values in both of these. Uh, but in this one, it, it collapses around a single value, but to a lesser extent because, again, there are a few people who are basically not changing. So that's like four slides to show the same thing, which is why I'm just kind of breezing through them. Um, the part that I was trying to originally trying to use as a selling point, but I now think it's probably not the strongest selling point, um, was that uh, this actually predicts um, people's attitude values in the next wave um, somewhat better than the observed network. Um, so this is as you take the number of iterate as you continue uh, running the model for more iterations, um, how how well does it go uh, in terms of the mean squared error predicting the attitudes of the next wave? Um, what you see. Is that the uh, predicted probabilities version uh, does substantially better than either the observed network or the uh, or the flip a coin version, the um, posterior predictive network, uh, and the observed network actually continues to be less accurate uh, throughout. So originally, when I when I'd originally written this, the review, that was kind of the end. I was like, look, it does well. It does better on a single test case. And the reviewer said, well, why that test case? How do we know you didn't just cherry pick it? Uh, and also, can we sh can we see this compared with other possible smoothing methods? Which mm -hmm. okay, fine. Um, so what we did, uh, so what I did at that point was uh, included all the things that they asked me to do, <laughs> and uh, one of them was to start looking at different smoothing methods. Um, so here, uh, instead of uh, using the the uh, a smooth like basically a smooth version of the network. Um, what we did was uh, basically say what happens if people just kind of converge to the class average. Um, so it's basically a weighted average of their current their attitude and the class average. And the idea here was to show how well predictions from the network, uh, basically how much is, to what extent is this just a function of averaging, every, just like bringing everybody to one average um, versus uh, actually smoothing the network. The other uh, version that they suggested was uh, including uh, basically smoothing the network using a much simpler version of a smoother. Uh, and so what they said was basically include a tie, um, include uh, include a dense, like basically a, a term for the for the density of the network, uh, and basically tie get have everybody be tied um, proportional to the density of the network, uh, and then kind of for like basically for the weight matrix have like uh, some balance of uh, the observed ties and kind of this fuzz term of you know everybody's connected to everybody else. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So in this case, when you when you tune the density, the density is what you're tuning here, right? Do you think? Yeah. So you're, you, are you taking comparing that to the observed density then, or? Um, yeah. So here, do you mind? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, please. Please. Yeah. yeah. Probably, probably do we have some, do you have markers? Okay. Yeah. So say you have. Um, say you have a, a network with a density, um, then what you would have is essentially, and so you've got this delta term. So would you randomly assign everyone to have a density of 20% um, or how would you do that? So then like what, what you would do is you would give, um, so let's say, so for the observed network we would basically, we would be setting this term to 1. Um, and so that would just be the observed network. Um, and then as you increase this term, you put more weight on it. So like basically, this is the observed network where you have say 
it does tie here, um, tie here, and on the board on the fly, but uh, ties it along here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Is that right? Anyway. Um, so like this is if this is the observed network, essentially what you're doing is you're saying um, as you increase that weight, uh, so like if the if the weight were 0.5, what you would do is you would change all of these to 0.5 times 0.05, and then this would be uh, what 0.5 times one plus 0.05 times 0.5. So essentially, you're adding to every term. You're adding um, kind of the the density of so like a, a weighted density of the network. So essentially, what you're doing is you're connecting everything. Right. Um, and so they wanted to know essentially how well is this going to do. Like how did, this is. Sorry, I don't think this is what the reviewer was actually going for. But what it does actually show um, is how well does this do if we just add a low weight tie to everybody else. Still respect the um, connection, the observed connections a little bit. Um, so actually, this, in effect, is uh, accomplishing what Chris Huckerson, I think that this is a, accomplishing what Chris Huckerson and Fowler found when they did their contagion studies, and they said that a person's obesity is not just based on the obesity to people they're directly connected with, but those people's obesity, their friends' obesity, and their friends' friends' obesity. That they had the three degrees of separation argument, yeah. which meant that it's, you know, it's, uh, I'm influenced by Kioske to the extent that Kioske may be influenced by other people. But I think what they found is that, no, I'm actually influenced by Kioske's friends above and beyond what Kioske's friends influence Kioske, right? So in other words, it's, it's almost like I had a direct connection, a weaker direct connection to Kioske's friends. Yeah. And in a sense, what you're doing is you're creating these indirect connections between people, not necessarily just Kiosk case friends, but across the entire network, right? Yeah. yeah, that's essentially both what I'm doing and both what and what this um mm -hmm. what this who's what is the citation for this one? Do you this remember? one there is no there's um, no citation. No, this okay. was something some reviewer thought of. Oh, okay. <laughs> kind of offhand. They were so like, it's why an don't you try some other it's an anonymous citation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, uh the the version that I had, uh so the late space model version, uh basically does something quite similar. It's just that it weights people who are closer together more heavily. Um, so essentially, it's it's really a question of are you very like to what extent are you varying the weights based on uh, actual observed ties versus kind of inferred ties from um, from a model. Okay. And what we're going to be looking at is if we can find it. So it's actually I should probably go back to this one. Um, essentially, what we're going to be looking at, because there's, there's a lot of different places, uh, there's a lot of different comparisons that you could make, so you can a little bit. Um, so what we're going to be looking at is between pool variance in this system. So like, how well does the does the observed network do versus the mean of the uh, predicted distribution, or sorry, the predicted probabilities? And we're going to be looking across a wide variety of attitude scales, uh, which, yeah, so. Attitudes about substance use, expectations about substance use. These are all like someone who actually knows how to write a survey actually did these. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, so essentially, uh, there will be a whole series of comparisons. So these, uh, the variance in these are going to be between uh, between school comparison or between school uh, variation. Uh, and so here's the uh, so here's the model that I was uh, suggesting, like the space model. Very similar to it are all of the uh, density smooth models, the ones on the board over there. Um, the little red model is the class average model, which is just averaging, just seeing how well we do just based on averaging. And then the observed network is up here. Um, these are uh, mean squared error, so lower numbers are better. Um, and we did these for all the waves and all of the, and all the different attitude values. Uh, and I actually find it uh, fairly difficult to read. So, uh, what I did was I looked at the, I mean, basically what you see is, first of all, the, the amount of error is increasing as it goes on. 
uh, oh, these alphas are how much you're weighting. Uh, my, like, this is complete social influence, and this is half social influence, half me saying the same. Um, so you can see that the, uh, the error that in the predictions is increasing over time. Uh, the observed network typically does a little bit worse. Um, and I actually, again, find this fairly difficult to read, so I just converted this into a percentage difference. So the fact that they were increasing over time, is that because you're taking only the initial data, or is it really you took each time's data and looked at the observed data at the different waves? Yeah, so each time is predicting the time t the next. predicting time t plus 1. So why do you think that it is getting worse? Kids grow up. They're being influenced by more, by people outside of the school more often. Oh, okay. And so there's more, there's increasing, there's also increasing variance in the question over time. Um, and so I think that's actually one of the giant gaping holes in the um, network literature for adolescents in schools in particular, uh, is that we don't yeah. really consider kids physical maturation in this process at all. Um, and that seems like a big missing point in here. Um, that's neither here nor there. Um, and it's, I don't, I don't think, does anybody here work with adolescent friendship data? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, that's probably not the most. Uh, relevant. Um, okay, so putting this on a percentage basis, um, these are all relative to the latent space model that I was predicting. So things that are higher are things that are doing worse, and things that are lower are things that are doing better. Um, in general, you, you're going to wind up seeing that the observed network does anywhere from about 5 to 10% uh, worse than the latent space model or than any other per, um, smoothing model. You'll see that most of the smoothing models um, do roughly the same, so that that gives you a sense that most of what's going, most of what, uh, most of the improvement in the prediction is from uh, is from smoothing the network at all. Although you do see um, that the class average model does slightly worse some of the time, um, which would have been a point in my favor, or in a point in the model's favor. So essentially, the, the density smoothing model and the latent space network model at some point are doing something be similar to each other, so it's kind of, it becomes fairly difficult to distinguish between there. The fact that they're, the fact that they wind up producing very similar predictions is not, should not be surprising because they're doing very similar. Um, here we have the version with all of the, uh, all of the waves, all of the schools. Um, you, again, you see that the observed network consistently does considerably worse. Um, the other smoothing models often do uh, particularly for school adjustment and bonding, but um, for some of the other attitudes, the other um, the other smoothing models also do somewhat worse than the observed network or than the latent space model, suggesting that you know the latent space model is actually picking up something important mm -hmm. about um, the structure of the network. Um, so that means probably you can't just throw away the network entirely. It does help to actually know something about it. Um, but in general, uh, yeah, it seems to be doing. Uh, the model that I was proposing seems to be doing somewhat better. Um, I do want to uh, temper the statement a little bit by saying that what this is probably doing is it's probably producing a biased low variance, a biased low variance estimate of what the uh, next wave's attitude values will be, um, and so that's going to give you a lower mean squared error, um, just kind of by design. It's not necessarily a bad thing if you're trying to predict something that that may be more effective, but. And it's certainly like the observed network is also giving you a biased thing, but it's giving you a biased higher variance <laughs> estimate. So, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily doing any better. Um, I'm going to skip over the conclusions and talk briefly about the future directions. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Um, Eight so, minutes. Oh, perfect. Um, because I think this is actually uh, the more interesting part of this. I had originally written this as, um, um, with the hope that it would be an intermediate step towards a few possible ends. Um, one of them, uh, that I think is kind of an immediate possible next step for this um, that I would I would love to see someone do is um, basically doing this kind of uncertainty propagation into a regression model. Um, so, for example, people uh, the reviewers sociology reviewers really 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 um, want to see regressions, um, and they were really concerned when there was not a regression in this paper, and they kept asking me why there wasn't one. And fortunately, uh, Mark Mizruki had written a paper about why the network autocorrelation model is biased and doesn't work. Um, 
And so fortunately, I was able to point to that paper and be like, look, this is, I, I'm not going to fix a bias model in a paper that's not about a regression. Um, you, we're just going to have to save that for another paper. Uh, but they do, but they, to the extent that they have a point, I think it would be valuable to basically cr construct some sort of uh, multiple imputation style scheme where we could say, like, oh, okay, for all of these, um, what is it? Um, the uh, the string, uh, the event history model with the. Um, you mean the relational event? No. No, it's the, um, it's the one where the, the people adopt, and it's like it's basically a survival model for people adopting. Um, Hazard rate? No. But not the viral model. Yeah, no, no. It's, okay. um, no it, it, uh, I'll, I'll remember this in a minute. Um, but for example, if you're, uh, oh, the heterogeneous uh, diffusion model, for mm. example, if mm. you're thinking of something like that, um, you might be able to incorporate uh, uncertainty about the network into, uh, into, some, into an estimate like that. Or similarly, for, um, for the stochastic actor oriented model, um, I think they would do well to incorporate some network uncertainty. The other area that I thought um, would be really interesting to take this um, is to basically think about cases where we can't measure the network, um, but we can measure something correlated with it. Um, so the idea here is that basically you can, anytime you can uh, construct a predicted probability from a tie from I to J, you can simulate a diffusion process. Uh, and so there are a number of cases where we can think of uh, predicted probabilities from I to J at kind of a population level, um, but we can't actually measure a network. Uh, so for example, uh, Jeff Smith and company have an article from about four years ago now um, talking about uh, interracial marriage as a way of thinking about um, interracial contact in the United States. Uh, you might be able to use that to think about, okay, here, if you're thinking about a diffusion process um, at the country level, you might be able to think about, okay, these groups have this contact rates and you could get a predicted probability of contact between these groups uh, and start to think about diffusion at that rate. Uh, similarly, Ashton Bertery has a paper, I think also I think from about four years ago, um, talking about uh, kinship uh, and kinlessness over time. So basically, as the, as the demographic transition uh, starts to happen, people have fewer children, which means that they have fewer ties to people of a younger age. So you could also look at uh, diffusion between uh, different age groups in, within a population, uh, and you could start to see like essentially um, how a diffusion process could unfold in uh, in combination with a uh, with a demographic process of people entering and exiting the population. What is the definition of a late fertility transition? Uh, in that case, um, that is a good question. That's from his paper. So I think that was a simulated uh, that was a simulated paper where he was saying basically here's what would happen if we had um, a fertility like yeah I don't know I'll I'll look it up. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so they, uh, the fertility transition, uh, oh, you know what, I do remember this. So the, uh, the demographic transition is like this, uh, got raised by time. It's something like uh, the, uh, the mortality rate falls off, and then sometime later the fertility rate falls off. And I think the distance, this distance is what he's referring to as later or early. Uh, um, so early means this distance is shorter and late means that distance is shorter. Okay. So anyway, so that's, that's, uh, that's this paper. Um, hopefully you will have found something interesting in it. I do think it could be also valuable, for example, if you were to, um, if you're looking at kind of continuously unfolding data. Oh, I do have a slide for this up there. Um, to look, so for example, uh, electronic communications data, I understand is a lot of what everybody here at Sonic works at, or works on. Um, and, so and a lot of survey data too, actually, so, especially small network survey oh. data in NASA okay. space, yeah. Um, but for the, uh, for the electronic uh, communications data, I think this could also be mm -hmm. uh, quite interesting because I think, again, those are, uh, those are correctly seen as uh, underlying draws, or draws from an underlying probability of interaction between people. Um, so these two people, uh, and you know, basically that probability of interaction is revealed over time, which is what this uh, uh, Lee Fosdick and McCormick paper is, uh, is trying to do. Um, and so essentially what, what it would be interesting to do is be able to take this, uh, this kind of model and say, okay, here, we've, now we've got a model for the uncertainty in this network, and now we can start to understand how uh, diffusion might unfold among these people 
given that there's uh, kind of a continuously uh, a revealed network. So, uh, so yeah, if you have any thoughts, questions, I'd love to see this used, or if you'd like to continue. <laughs> That's yeah. good. Question? Uh, let's, let's do a round of applause. Question. Yeah, it's pretty cool to see you know, predicting some like uncertain, like uncertain ties. I was question about like uh, actual individual attributes because that's sort of the prediction side. Yeah. And did you actually like measure like re reliability of like um, how like each individual like report? They're like smoking behavior or deviance, because even like uh, these like survey question might have like errors and an uncertainty. Yeah. So just think about like how to control that aspect. That's a great question. Um, the glib answer is no, I did not. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think uh, one of the reviewers did ask me about that. Um, we uh, essentially I was kind of trying to solve one problem of uncertainty at a time in this paper. Um, and because I didn't have a regression model, I, I didn't have like a whole structural equation framework to, to kind of take into account the uncertainty in the network in the questions. So I took the, the an their answers to, to survey questions as parameters. Um, but that said, I, I think you're right that they, we would probably do well to, to account their uncertainty. Sorry that I don't really have no, to no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, like uh, you thought about like, you know, sort of a social influence, influence side. Yeah. That means like if you think about somehow like incorporate like your approach to the actual like survey question answers, that'd be I think interesting way to sort of appeal survey researchers. Yeah, no, I, I think that's absolutely right. So I, I think um you know, part of part of the reason that I don't you know, I'm I'm mixed on the on the predictions of future attitudes of uh, a selling point for the importance of uh, this approach. Um, and the reason for that is because I don't know exactly how much it matters um, to have a kid report that they are they believe strongly that it's that smoking is wrong at the you know like mm. like how how meaningful is that particular is that particular difference um, which is probably a good argument for me getting out of studying adolescence but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no I, that, that's a good point unfortunately I didn't do much with it uh, yeah. I think there's a lot of room to do a lot of interest. Other questions? I mean, the fact that you're seeing all this fluctuation in the network would, if it was, if it was a real fluctuation, real fluctuation, and if networks made a different to attitudes, you would see massive fluctuation in the attitudes as well. But you're not seeing those massive fluctuation in the attitudes from day to day basis, right? I mean, I don't think so. yeah. So those are much smoother. So it's either that these network variables are noisy, as you are arguing, or that networks within the school are not the major driving force, that there may be something else from the outside that is actually tempering and stabilizing it. So I think the other, um, the other argument in favor of, of this method is that it starts to, by putting error bars on the predictions yeah. from the preteen model, we can start yeah. to say this model is actually the wrong model. So mm -hmm. it's not just that we're measuring the wrong network, it's actually like, you know, even if you include some uncertainty about the network that we're measuring, mm -hmm. you still don't get the right mm -hmm. answer. Um, so we need to start thinking about a different model. Yeah. Well, I guess my question is uh, less about the way you use the frequent model, but more about the problems of the frequent model. So you, you said that, that it all converges quite quickly. But what about in like negative influence, where kids want to distance themselves from like the nerds or the jocks? You know, they want to distinguish themselves in some way. So if they see some group not smoking, they think, hey, let's start smoking. Or you know, it, it's kind of a, a perverse mentality. But if you had a you know a negative sign on the influence that Maybe you'd see the the, the, air, the, the variability um, data for a little longer. Yeah. So what you would probably, um, if you put a negative sign on the influence, uh, essentially you would get a. I mean, it kind of depends on where. You, if you put just like one negative sign in there, you're going to get a cycle, I think. Yeah. Um, but if you if you kind of block off a group and say that this group is opposed to all the other groups, and they kind of they kind of move apart from the other groups. Uh, then you might see them kind of converge to their own uh, little consensus on, on smoking, which might actually be what's going on. So did you, did you see what the variability is like in the, just the, the observed data? Uh, yes. Does it, does it... No, you didn't. It's in the appendix slide. Do you have that one? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
you were talking about like like the mean and variance of, yeah, the, of the actual scales exactly. over time. Yeah. So see, it's not varying that much. It's, a, it's very much smoother than. I mean, the the, uh, the it does vary a little bit over time. Right. right? Like so, right. Incre like ma mainly what happens is the variance increases, particularly about expectations of potency. So basically, when kids are in, in the beginning of middle school, they think every substance is really bad, and by the time they are in twelfth grade, they really kind of a lot. So many of them have kind of come down off of the well, maybe smoking is terrible. Yeah. Um, and like similarly with the deviance, you kind of see it increasing, like the variance basically increasing over yeah. time. Um, school adjustment and bonding and attitudes towards the, well, school adjustment and bonding stays relatively similar over time, kind of on an average. Yeah. Like what you found too, that the school adjustment and bonding was, was like the one where the variance or the, the, the residual error dropped. Right. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, the, uh, I, think, I think to your broader question, um, that uh, essentially, how would you incorporate uh, kind of negative or, you know, basically non-convergent influences? Uh, I think that's actually largely an open question. There have been a few models um, that have kind of attempted to produce polar. Essentially, those are polarizing. Yeah, 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 exactly. So like you've got the Baldessari and Bar who was the other person on that? Uh, you had the site actually up yeah, there. Um, <laughs> it's a Baldessari uh, paper. Baldessari like, yeah. and the one? Yeah. Beerman. Beerman, that's right. Beerman, yeah. B, so they, yes. So yeah. Like a, uh, thank you. Sorry, yes. uh, sorry to put everybody on the spot. Um, but yeah, there's like, you know, there's a whole cottage industry of models yeah. that produce polarization. I was kind of thinking of it from a Borgesian sense, using social space already, and yeah. every part of the space wants to distinguish itself from something. Like it would be a natural. Yeah, so I think. I mean, basically, I the I don't know of a, a well-validated network model that does that. I could just totally be missing one. I mean, that's fairly no, no, I don't think you are. I mean, I, one of the things that we've been looking at in the Kenya data, which is survey data, but from an entire two villages about modern contraceptive methods, so it's kind of health-related, but not adolescence. Um, and uh, one of the things that Alina, who's not here with us today, I don't think. Um, and Brennan and I are looking at is this a, is the assumption of asymmetry that um, it I mean these models make the assumption that if I talk to a friend and the friend smokes that influence on in me is going to be the same as if I talk to a friend and that friend doesn't smoke right. and I think part of the issue is that there are some things that are more contagious that you're more likely to be influenced by a friend who smokes to start smoking than a friend who doesn't smoke to quit smoking. And I think trying to understand how we would parse that is not something at least I've found in the literature. Maybe if anyone in the room has come across an article that does that, I would like to see that. But I think there is always built in assumption that the contagion effect is neutral to whether something is a pro or an anti behavior, if you may, in some ways, or a you know, good or a bad behavior. Do you know of anything? I think there's some of um, Greek and students that have Develop this model more. Clayton Childress at Toronto had this data on book clubs over time, uh -huh. and it was something about confidence of their belief that, that kind of created some asymmetry. Um, and and what's his name who was over here? Um, Craig. Uh, uh, Craig Lowland. Was yeah, yeah, and that was that was Duke. Um, yeah, but he, he had worked on this with him. They were they were both recent oh. students, so they 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 had some directedness. Okay, so I, know, I do know about work that focuses on how much uncertainty you have, that if I am, you know, if someone is much more likely to influence me about what clothes I wear because I don't feel very confident about that, but no one's going to influence me easily about what gizmo to get because I feel pretty confident about that. About interpersonal. But if it's interpersonal, okay. Okay. Maybe charisma or something. Okay, interesting. Any closing questions? I'll ask you something that I think I, that you touched on. So you talked about connectionist and positionist approaches, and I and I, I assumed, and I'm not sure it is the same thing anymore after looking at some of your following slides, but you know, back in the 1980s, late 80s, there was a big sort of debate between what was called as relational versus positional approaches applied to contagion. That, uh, that actually, oh, that's interesting. So that whole stuff that, you know, I mean, and Ron Burt's argument was that, the, you know, his AJS piece from 88, it was that I'm more likely to be influenced by people who I'm directly connected with. That's what he called 
contagion by cohesion, and cohesion is similar to what you're talking about is relational or connectionist approach, as opposed to I'm more likely to be influenced by people with whom I'm structurally equivalent, which would be the positional approach, which just says, I don't need to talk to you, but if you and I talk to the same people in a structural equivalent sense, or we play a similar role and we have a similar position, two professors at Northwestern who may never even talk to each other and may not even talk to the same students are likely to have similar opinions because of the role they play in the network. And so I'm not, I'm, I mean, when, when I, I, I'm not familiar with that connectionist and uh, positionist uh, framework that you described there. Is that a paper that uses that phrase or is that your? That is a, that is a good question. Um, so originally that was, I took that from a lecture that Jim gave. I asked okay. him where that came from, and he cited Bert okay. in the article. And then I, I mentioned, I like, I looked through that article, and I didn't see, or maybe I looked through the wrong article and didn't see that. And so I, I kept asking him, and then okay, figured out. okay. So um, since then, I found there were a series of Steve Borgatti articles in the early 2000s that kind of outlined yeah. that distinction. Yeah. Um, so that is. Yeah, so it goes back to the sort of the, it, I think Ron made that argument in part because he was trying to make a case for why structural equivalence or why positional approaches are more influential from his point of view in terms of contagion than what cohesion was. That was a very controversial issue, and so that was, there was a whole series of studies that came out shortly thereafter trying to decide which was better than the other, et cetera. So That's anyway, cool. yes, well, thank you all for coming, and good, great presentation again. We give a little we give a little thank you gift to our presenters so you get a little something from us. Thank you. And do you have to uh, do we have a schedule for Jake meeting with folks? Okay. You're next. And then but we have this room that is gonna be used. Oh you can use my office. You sure? Okay. Okay. Okay, that sounds good too. Well, thank you. No, this is great. And so we uh, we have other meetings coming up here, but we also have meetings with Jake. So you get a chance to follow up with Jake. Great. This is awesome. Was somebody else who wrote about the relational versus positional approach to that? I thought you were going with that. Was one of the things I realized after writing.